Right, the door is closed. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Geological Society of London and to this, the fourth Shell Lecture for 2013 entitled Rivers Under the Sea. My name is David Shulston. I'm president of the Society and it's my pleasure to thank Shell for making this series of public lectures possible. The modern seafloor is crisscrossed by giant channels that are kilometers long, thousands of kilometers long, kilometers wide, and hundreds of meters deep. These are the feeder systems and arteries of submarine fans, the largest sedimentary deposits on Earth. Yet they are perhaps the most poorly known large scale geomo geomorphological features on our planet. Jeff Peacock will tell us more about them tonight. Jeff is professor of process sedimentology at the University of Leeds and his Research uses field measurements of active geophysical flows, laboratory experiments, numerical modeling, and analysis of sedimentary deposits to study a wide range of Earth surface processes, especially, as we'll hear, submarine channels. Jeff also works extensively on applied sedimentation problems related to nuclear waste decommissioning. And most recently, he led work on the fluid dynamic properties of the fabrics of the Speedo swimsuit. At the London Olympics. I don't know whether Jeff is going to talk about that tonight. Maybe it'll be a question afterwards. Ladies and gentlemen, please wel welcome Professor Jeff Peacock. Hi, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here this evening. Um, my main challenge is to try and remain broadly in one place. So uh, if any of you ever had lectures with me, I know a couple of my students here this afternoon, then uh, you'll know that I'm prone to generally wandering around the stage. So anyway, if you see me sliding off, then uh, please try and direct me back. Give me some hand signals. Um, so, so yeah, as mentioned, I'm very keen to kind of introduce you to uh, Rivers Under the Sea, uh, which I think in many ways are, are perhaps the least broadly known channel systems uh, in the entire solar system, which is rather odd, given that they're, uh, they're right here on Earth. Uh, so the example up on the screen, is about a 125-mile segment of the, uh, the Amazon uh, submarine fan. So you can see a variety of, of wiggly channels uh, in here. Uh, they, they're actually proud of the seafloor, so they're uh, actually several hundred meters up. And, uh, and this is part of a system that's about 900 kilometers in length. So these are big systems. I think most of us are familiar with, uh, with river systems. So this is the, uh, the Paraná. Uh, in Argentina, and um, they're, they're, these are the major agents of, of sediment transport over most of the uh, uh, of the Earth's uh, land surface. But there's also huge focus, certainly in the media and, and popular science articles, on uh, channel systems elsewhere in uh, uh, in the solar system. So these are the uh, the great outflow channels on uh, on Mars through here. So huge systems up to sort of three and a half thousand kilometers. Two and a half thousand miles in uh, in length, and some of them, admittedly, are beautiful. So, uh, so this is another one of these Martian channel networks through here. So they've gained huge, huge attention. Perhaps a little bit less, but there is also uh, attention in the sort of popular science media for other channels. So these are um, uh, channels on Venus. Uh, so these are probably lava flow type channels, though that is debated. Um, and more recently. There's been huge coverage for, uh, for channels on Titan. So Titan is the largest of, uh, of Saturn's moons, uh, and it's perhaps unique uh, outside of Earth insofar as it actually has flowing channels. So these are, it's a little bit colder even than, uh, than the UK in winter, but, uh, but uh, these are actually liquid methane that is, uh, that is flowing through these, so maybe not the place to go and visit on holiday. Um, but I want to introduce you to... Um, to, to flowing channels, in many cases uh, still flowing, uh, that are of at least equal, if not larger size, right here on Earth, but, uh, but below the waves. So, uh, as mentioned uh, in the introduction, um, there are a variety of these, and, uh, and they form the kind of the arteries, the sort of backbone of, um, uh, of submarine fans, which is said are the largest sedimentary deposits on Earth. So it's really, I always like to think of it as what rocks want to be. Rocks, you know, they start young and everything else, and they are sort of aiming towards geological heaven or nirvana, uh, and uh, and that's to aim, end up in a in a submarine fan, and and um, many of them are very successful in this. So uh, the, the Bengal fan here is is something like uh, 
2,000 miles long and about 700 miles wide. So basically, the, the fans here are the sort of smooth areas of the seafloor. Anything that's got sediment over the top, so haven't got these ridges uh, in here. And um, and it's about 16 and a half kilometers, uh, or 10 miles, 12 miles or so, uh, in terms of thickness. So huge volumes of, of sediment in here. And all that sediment, or the majority of that sediment, is moved uh, across these by submarine channels. Uh, so if we zoom in here on uh, on the channels on the, uh, the Indus fan, um, the other side of India, then uh, you can see that you get a whole series of these relic channels across the surface, um, many of which have got enormous uh, sinuosity. So um, some of these here, just huge sinuosity here, incredibly tortuous. So by sinuosity, uh, I'm, I mean wiggliness uh, in, uh, in general. Um, but uh, as well as the submarine fans, uh, you also get submarine channels in a variety of other locations. So deep ocean channels uh, tend to form in more sort of active margins where you've got uh, far more in the way of sort of earthquake activity um, and, and where you don't necessarily get large accumulations of sediment. But nevertheless, the channels transport sediment very large distances. So this is off of uh, New Zealand in here. This is the Hikarangi Channel. Uh, and this goes for about 2,000 kilometers um, into deep water. So it's still transporting sediments very large distances. Um, and perhaps the, uh, the largest of all channels that we've, uh, we've observed so far uh, is the North uh, Atlantic Mid-Ocean Channel, uh, better known in many ways as NAMOC. It's much, uh, much quicker to say. And, and this, you can see, it rises between Greenland uh, and Labrador, and it travels for about 3,800 kilometers down to uh, ends, sort of comes around in here and ends in the Somme Abyssal Plain. And basically, abyssal plains are the, they are the deepest points of the ocean. You can't go any further. Um, so they're not quite of the scale of our biggest rivers. So in terms of things like um, the Nile and the Amazon, uh, they're of the order of, of um, sort of 6,000 kilometers or so. Um, but they are, nevertheless, this is longer than any other channel on the solar system. So the, the outflow channels, even the longest of the outflow channels on Mars, are shorter than this. So they are very much giant, giant features. Um, we also see channels on, uh, on the slope, on the continental slope uh, in here. So these are off of Alaska. And you see these beautiful uh, high-resolution sort of seafloor imagery uh, of these. And if I zoom in on, that, on this shot, um, it shows you where the slope is um, insofar, insofar as uh, it links the, the shelf, which is in sort of a couple of hundred meters or so of, of water, down into, uh, into deeper water. So you've got a whole series of channels here, and then you can see that some of them go much further. Um, so all of these channels have in common the fact that they, they're fed um, by sediment that's crossing the continental um, shelf and, uh, and then being moved into deeper water by these channels. So in many ways, now is a terrible time to have been born um, a geologist interested in submarine channels because sea level is high and sadly going higher. And um, when sea level is high, then an awful lot of sediment gets trapped on the shelf. It doesn't make it across and into deeper water. Uh, so many of these systems are, in fact, relict. It would have been altogether been lovely to have been born at some sort of time when sea levels were much lower, and particularly if they were low enough that they were close to the shelf edge, because back then rivers would have come right across the, the continental shelf and would have been, been uh, linked up into, uh, into canyons, such as this one, and, uh, and onto our slope. But nevertheless, actually, even today, there are um, quite a few examples where, where we still have active um, channels, even within the deep sea. So all of those that I introduced you to before were, were what I called sort of margin-linked um, um, submarine channels. So all of those have an obvious source of sediment coming off of the land surface to them. But uh, in recent years, we've also, much to our surprise, discovered that there are submarine channels um, appear in a whole variety of other places. We're only really beginning to get the first hints. Uh, and certainly, I've called these non-margin um, ocean channels. And you see these in things like island arcs, or particularly like this one is uh, um, a relict island arc. So it's all beneath the waves. These are, uh, these are underwater volcanoes in here. And you can see a whole series of channels and really complex channel networks coming off of here. And um, it's really quite surprising. Um, but presumably, somehow or other, our volcanoes are collapsing very rapidly uh, and forming flows that are able to go through these. And I suspect as we get more imagery uh, of, the, of the modern seafloor that we'll suddenly discover a lot more of these. Uh, certainly, some of the imagery I've seen suggests there's plenty more out there. But part of the problem here is that water is a very difficult thing to image through. So um, the great thing about many of these planets 
elsewhere in the solar system and moons is that they've got no atmospheres and, uh, and no li liquid water uh, on the surface in order to get in the way of proper measurements. So an awful lot of our ocean floor, we just don't have um, any kind of close-up um, high-resolution topography that, uh, that we would be able to see channels on. So as that gradually arrives, I'm, I'm, undoubtedly we will see far more of these. Uh, the other place, of course, we see them is in the subsurface. So the, the wonders of, uh, of in particular, three-dimensional seismic, which is, uh, which is sort of an Earth viewing tool um, used by, uh, in particular, the uh, uh, oil industry, um, has shown very large numbers of these. In particular, it's shown very, very large numbers of them because that's what they're looking for. Uh, offshore, so we'll say more about that, uh, about that later. But you can do wonderful things here. So you either see maps such as this, which are, are sort of a, a time slice, a section through the data that show a whole series of, of wiggly channels. Uh, or actually, when you, when you have other data, you can actually pick out the, the shapes of it and drape it with, uh, with your data and so on. So uh, yeah, huge numbers in the, uh, in the subsurface, and they're very important. OK, so what kinds of flows um, traverse these? Well, the honest truth is, we don't know very much about them. So, um, but what we do know is that they're gravity currents. They're mixtures of, uh, of particles and fluid. And they form flows. So hopefully, ah, here we go. So uh, here's an example of one of these. Um, obviously not from the modern, but from, uh, from a laboratory uh, uh, setup. And so uh, you've got a series of particles uh, within a fluid. And overall, it's much denser than the surrounding water that it's in. You can see the sort of reflections coming off of the, uh, the water surface there. And uh, that'd be pretty terrifying if you happen to be down in the, uh, in the deep sea when one of these went off. I don't think you'd last long. So, uh... so they are actually close cousins of, of things that we know uh, perhaps more familiar to us. So things like snow avalanches and uh, pyroclastic flows. So when you have uh, volcanic collapses coming down, these are the same sort of thing. They're, they're gravity currents and they're driven by, uh, by a, a density difference. OK, so when, when these things uh, start, we can form them in uh, two ways, these flows. So either uh, if we have very high runoff, um, particularly in mountainous areas, um, such as places in Taiwan um, and other um, steep islands, um, then we can often get enough sediment in the system, that uh, in a river system, that when it hits the coast, it's dense enough that it simply just carries on, just keeps going. Um, or we get collapse of sediment on the, uh, on the slopes. So sediment gradually builds up over time and then periodically it fails. Uh, and, uh, and when it does that, we can actually generate the things like small tsunami. So in fact, this is, um, I, I, I take it nobody's um, booked a holiday flying into Nice this summer, have they? <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to put anyone off their holiday. Uh, oh, good. Uh, so, uh, so this was actually when, uh, in, back in 1979, they were kind of extending, they were building a new breakwater off of uh, Nice Airport when, uh, when it disappeared and uh, a big chunk of it failed and, uh, and it slipped straight down the, uh, the VAR submarine canyon uh, and out into, the, um, uh, out into the channel, went for about 120 miles in, uh, in total. Uh, and it did generate, uh, when, it, when that happened, it generated a small tsunami. You can see, in fact, these two images are sort of a, a, an at the time. So look at this building here, which is, which is in fact this one. Um, so yes, it generates a tsunami at uh, it was about three and a half meters uh, in height, and, uh, and caused actually quite a lot of devastation. So about eight people died in in this event, and uh, and one of the bulldozers from the airport was discovered about a, a kilometer down the uh, the canyon. So uh, it was moving some pretty big particles quite a long way, uh, but the sand itself went much further. So um, so there is a little risk associated with uh, with these. Um, as mentioned before, we have remarkably few uh, real data of, of what these flows are doing. Uh, so these are probably the very best data there is out there. Uh, these are velocity data from uh, about four kilometers uh, off of the Zaire fan. Uh, and what you can see here is that um, you've got a, a couple of data points. The, the gray line here is, uh, oh, um, sorry, the dotted line on this one is current speed 30 meters above the bottom. Uh, and the black line here is current speed 150 meters above the bottom. So there was a, a whole period of, uh, of, of nothing happening. Uh, and then suddenly in, in this bit, which is sort of blown up here, we get a, um, uh, an event at one of these, um, what we call turbidity currents, one of these um, gravity currents coming through. And, uh, and you can see that, um, that at the top here, of 150 meters above, it gets in excess of uh, 1.2 meters per second. Sadly, we lose the data uh, further down. This, uh, this is because it breaks 
So this is a big problem about measuring these things. So even 30 meters above the bottom, what happened was uh, there was a sediment trap that exploded. There were a whole series of water bottles. They uh, were all stuffed to the rafters with, uh, with sediment, no water left in them at least not of note, when, uh, when they recovered them. Uh, the, the, the propeller um, that was measuring the speed at 30 meters, well, various bits of that broke off and disappeared altogether, and the rest was just broken. There are a couple of turbidity meters which uh, uh, measure the kind of a, a surrogate for concentration. Uh, one of those broke, the other one vanished. Um, and in fact, the, even, even the higher one, eventually, uh, that just snapped. The mooring that was on there, all sort of tied to a, a big vertical mooring, that just broke uh, and, uh, and landed back at the surface. But uh, even with the data we've got, we can see that 150 meters above the bottom, 1.2 meters a second, and that's a time average. So in fact, the way this data works, that's, that's measured over an hour. So it was, it was undoubtedly going much faster than this, uh, but it gives you an indication of the size and power of, uh, of these. It's also, I think, as an academic, um, one of the ways to have a very short career, because um, if, you, if you write a grant and, and uh, successfully get it funded to put a whole lot of equipment down a submarine canyon, then it vanishes. And it's all broken, and uh, you spent all that taxpayers' uh, taxpayers' money on it. Then it's not going to look good. So, um, so uh, yeah, there hasn't been a lot of this done. Um, but uh, talking about Zaire, they, um, we, we know how active it is because we have also been out and uh, and caught it, and um, and you can see that uh, sediment makes its way all the way to the end. So this is about a thousand kilometres down system, uh, and you can see this is. Maybe, maybe you're not as excited as I am, but uh, for a sedimentologist like me, these are pretty dramatic uh, numbers. So in the, what we call the lobes, which are the bits at the end of the submarine channels, uh, the estimates are between some half a metre and a metre or so of sediment within the last century. Um, and remember, this is, uh, so this is very high sedimentation rates, uh, and this is at a time when sea levels are high. So uh, when sea levels are low and things are really properly connected, you'd expect to get even higher rates. So huge amounts of sediment are moving uh, through these systems. So despite the fact that we have a little bit of real data, most of the time um, our, our real knowledge of, uh, of these kinds of currents that traverse these uh, submarine channels comes from cable breaks. So uh, it's unintentional data. So, uh, so this is an example from, uh, from Taiwan uh, from 2009. And, uh, and there's a whole series of, of cable breaks um, down down this uh, channel system in here. And in fact, you can see that uh, they went in two goes. Some of them went quite early. So these are probably the ones connected directly to the river inputs. This was during a big typhoon. It's huge. About 150 million tonnes of sediment arrived at the head of the, uh, the canyon here over that time period. Uh, and then a whole series of them went a few days later. So this rather su suggests that uh, some of this was uh, failed a few days later and you had, uh, in fact, a even bigger currents that went much further. And again, these went at least... 160 kilometers down system. We don't know how much further they went. That was the position of the last cable. So it broke every cable um, until it ran out of cables to, uh, to break. So in fact, these in some ways are, uh, can be quite important for us because uh, despite the fact that we tend to get used to uh, the delights of Wi-Fi, um, that's really only connecting you to a base station. Uh, and from there, it all goes by cable. And uh, in fact, 95% of voice, data, and internet uh, that's transoceanic, goes by uh, by seafloor cables. So almost nothing goes by by satellite, um, and uh, and this causes problems. So they, that Taiwanese canyon that uh, I talked about in 2006, it really caused problems when an even bigger flow took out uh, even more cables, and uh, a huge part of uh, uh, of uh, Eastern Asia was uh, was left with uh, with a real capacity problem in terms of things like the internet. So people are looking at these flows um, and looking at the positioning of, of cables. In particular, you'll notice things like, uh, like in Africa, there's very few of them at the moment, but uh, as they need more, getting things across things like the Zaire Canyon, like I talked about uh, earlier, is going to be really difficult because there are frequent big flows down there. So uh, that, that's a challenge for, uh, for engineers. So they're important in that way. You'll have to uh, forgive me, but I found the concept of finding a slide to show organic carbon somewhat difficult. So um, you have to make do with a big pile of leaves, which, uh, which in some ways is, is, is how uh, it starts. Um, but there's obviously huge interest uh, with climate change and things in knowing what our carbon budgets are. And actually, we have very little idea how much carbon is being moved into, uh, into deep water and potentially locked up. In some ways, it's a, good, it's a good thing, because if any carbon that's making out here has every, every chance of being buried rapidly, 
and, uh, and being taken out of the, uh, the cycle. What we do know from the little bit of work that's been done to date is that certainly in some systems, again in the Zaire, it's probably the best studied, but, uh, but the, the levees, which are sort of the channel banks in here, sort of mud-rich sediments, uh, they've got about 3% organic carbon uh, within them that is being preserved. They're being buried rapidly enough that, uh, that this is not all getting eaten and recycled. Um, and actually, this is quite a lot. Um, it's enough, certainly in many millions of years to come, in order to make gas that would be you know, commercial quantities. Um, so there certainly are hints that we've got quite a lot of, um, uh, of material uh, that's going into these. We also know from the ancient uh, that we have, we do actually have producing fields um, which are coming from terrestrially sourced uh, organic carbon like this, from basically from leaves. So, uh, so yes, these are important. And this is certainly something that's being looked at far more. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, of course, is producing uh, old organic carbon, uh, probably in the main um, not land-derived, but, uh, but uh, derived uh, directly from, uh, from marine deposits. Uh, and submarine channels are very important here because they provide the sources of sand, coarse grain sediment, which you can produce um, oil and gas from. So they're not the source rocks, they're not, they're not generating the, uh, the hydrocarbons, but they're where they end up. So when you see people uh, drilling offshore, then uh, the, in the majority of cases, then they are looking for the deposits of submarine channels or the deposits that have flowed through submarine channels. So there's a huge amount of interest in, uh, in understanding those. And certainly as we go into progressively deeper water, we're going to see even more of this. Ah, so that's a little introduction, as it were, into uh, the wonderful world of, of submarine channels. And so I hope uh, I've convinced you at least that, uh, that they're of interest and every bit as interesting as some of the more media-worthy uh, channels on, on other planets. And insofar as uh, anything else, they, they clearly directly affect us in a variety of ways. But what I want to do now is, uh, is to look at how our view of them has changed over the past 15 years or so, because about that long ago, we generally just considered them to be like rivers. They look very wiggly, they, they look like rivers on some of the surface images that I've shown you. And uh, certainly when I used to go and visit um, hydrocarbon companies, uh, when they try and model these rocks, then they didn't have a module that said submarine channels, but they did have one that said rivers, and they were very happy, by and large, just simply just to use that. Uh, but I think what we've discovered is that uh, it's actually they're really very different uh, from uh, from river channels, and I hope to uh, to show you a little bit of that in the time that remains. Uh, the first thing is that uh, I'll show another river. Uh, so this is the Rakaia River from uh, from New Zealand. Uh, and this is what we call a uh, multi-thread or a braided channel. And I'm not going to show you any examples of this from the deep sea, because I couldn't actually find a convincing enough image to show you, which I think says something about the fact that uh, braided systems in the deep sea seem to be very difficult to find. They're purported to be out there, but um, even the best examples are normally linked to other things. So they've often got mud volcanoes or something which bars are forming around or various other things. It's hard to see many of them on our modern ocean floors. Uh, so what I'm going to do instead is going, I'm going to stick to single thread, uh, sort of meandering channels, um, because there are certainly lots of these out there. And, uh, and this is where the majority of work has, has been on. So first of all, a test and an opportunity to wake a few of you up if you've already dozed off in the heat of this lecture theatre. Uh, so hopefully we can spot some of the differences ourselves between submarine uh, channels and rivers. So which of these is the submarine channel and which of these is the river? And potentially, a more difficult question, why? So don't be afraid of getting things wrong. Who wants to, who wants to be brave and have a go? Which, which, which is B is a river, is it? Is that right? You are perfectly correct. Excellent. Very good. And uh, any any ideas as to why? Oh, you are you are a genius. You are a genius. Well, excellent. Well, congratulations there. Fan well, well, there we are. Fan fantastic, fantastic. Well, some of you, the other clue here, which would have been cheating, so it's good that you didn't do that, is the fact that if you look to some of these images, that and the, uh, the marine ones are often a stripey because the instrument that we use here, a thing called a side scan sonar, you can't actually image directly underneath the ship. So it always leads, leaves these lines. But you're quite correct that um, th this image here, which is a synthetic aperture radar uh, image, I could, uh, um, 
which makes it look the same. Uh, it's a very similar sort of uh, uh, technology, um, but it's full of oxbows, and, uh, and rivers do this. Um, they show lots, which is the surprising thing here is that uh, despite the fact you've got enormous tortuosity and things in here, very, very few um, cutoffs. In fact, the strange thing was um, that they actually published papers on the few cutoffs that there are, um, saying, oh, look, look, we've got a cutoff like rivers. <laughs> kind of, I think, in some ways, missing the point which you've obviously identified straight away, that, um, that actually it's the sheer number of cutoffs and oxbows that you get in, in, in uh, land, land uh, uh, channels, rivers, that, uh, that you just don't see in the deep sea. So why is that? Um, well, first and foremost, let's have a look at the fact there are some differences. So I apologize, one or two places here, you just have to stay with me because we do know a little bit of fluid dynamics, but anyway, hopefully it won't be too painful. Um, but we should expect some differences here because uh, these gravity currents, turbidity currents, there's, there's drag or friction uh, on both boundaries, so basically the top and the bottom. You know, in a river, you've only got friction with air. Basically, air loses, so we tend to, be, to ignore it. Um, so this is important. Uh, you also have effective gravity is less for subaerial flow. So what I mean by that uh, is, is the, it's the density difference. So when you're, uh, when you're swimming about in water, um, you're not much... Um, denser than the water, because in fact you are mainly water, you're about 70% water. Um, so as a consequence, you don't sink very quickly through it. Um, so it's the same gravitational force, but um, whilst e equally, if you if you uh, jumped out of the top floor of a, of a tall building or something, you'd go very rapidly, uh, and that wouldn't be good news. So so in, in the case of gravity currents, such as this one in here, which you can see, um, then it's, it's basically, if you've got seawater, or in this case, it's, uh, it's in a lake. So if you've got lake water, so fresh water, uh, above and in this, then the only thing that gravity is acting on is the sediment that's within the flow. So it's just the sediment that gravity acts upon. So they're, they're orders of magnitude, sort of uh, less density difference than, uh, than we might see in, say, a river. Uh, you also get, oh, go on. Uh, hang on. You also get ambient fluid entrainment. So what that means is that the, uh, the, the water above the current can mix into, uh, into your gravity current. Um, now, you do see this a little bit in rivers, because if you ever look at a waterfall, it actually manages to mix a lot of air uh, in at a waterfall, but actually air and water don't really want to mix, so that air pops out again pretty quickly. But if you've got water and water, they're very happy to mix. So uh, currents mix and evolve uh, as they move down systems. So, as I said, we might expect, just on fundamental grounds, to see some, uh, some differences. Ah, so if we look at, uh, say, the plan form from above uh, in here, so we're sort of looking down on channels, then we can see that submarine channels, um, by and large, are schematic here, but, but um, they're very different. So in this one, you see uh, bend expansion. So over time, bends start fairly, channels start fairly straight, and they, they get wigglier over time. Uh, sinuosity increases. But in a river, you also see some translation downstream. So, so we call this first thing, which is sort of this bend growth, we call this swing, is the sort of uh, geomorphological term for this. But uh, what we don't see much of in uh, submarine channels is, uh, is sweep, which is this kind of downstream migration of, uh, of systems. So this is what happens in rivers. Because they're basically, uh, meander bends are always migrating downstream, then, of course, if you get a significant tortuosity, they'll always break up and you end up with lots of oxbows. Whilst in this kind of system, if, in fact, they kind of lock up and they don't move uh, down system, then this explains why submarine channels uh, have so few of them. So, unfortunately, we don't understand exactly why submarine channels do this. Uh, but here's an example of this just from seismic. So, uh, if you look in, um, in down here, so these are taken in 10 meter slices over 40 meters. Uh, and these are, again, the sort of plan form images in here. And you can see there's little bits of movement between these. But basically, the submarine channel has stayed in the same sort of form over about 40 meters of, uh, of sediment buildup. Um, and when you put that together, you end up with these very ribbon-like geometries in here. So uh, channel behavior, even channel growth, is very slow compared with how, how you build the sediment up. So even some rivers do build up. Um, so things like the Yellow River, in fact, builds up above its floodplain. Um, but still, the channel bends move much more rapidly than, uh, than the actual buildup of the sediment. So when we first uh, published this oh, back in 2000, then this was reasonably controversial. But... Um, but luckily, um, seismic imaging came along and actually showed that you see loads of examples of these nowadays where um, if you look at these, you can actually see, so this is at a, um, so you've got a, um, a submarine ch uh, channel in here. If you look at one of the bends, the actual bend apex, the sort of tight part, 
then you can actually see in cross-section these things, basically this is bend expansion with some of this sediment buildup or aggradation. Uh, and then it basically locks up and just degrades. And these, these can um, build up over, I said, hundreds of meters in height in some cases. Uh, you should note there is a vertical exaggeration here. So if you take away the vertical, it doesn't look quite as, uh, as impressive. But nevertheless, this is something that rivers just simply do not do. So they're very different in terms of their basic behavior and morphology. Okay, so uh, I'm the, um, the director of, of uh, NERC's uh, Environmental Fluid Dynamics Lab. Um, so we do go and, uh, and measure things in, uh, in laboratories. It's particularly useful when it comes to submarine channels because, as I said, it's exceptionally difficult to actually go and study the uh, to real currents uh, in here, but more of those later. Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce you to some experiments that, uh, that we did to, uh, to look at the sort of the flow dynamics of these. And aha, who remembers these? Hey, excellent. Good. So the slinkies are still, still there, alive and well in your memories. Good. So... Um, uh, so uh, basically, any kind of bend flow is, is three-dimensional, and it's, it's basically a helix, like a slinky, albeit what I would really do. I did wonder about actually doing this with the audience, uh, but I thought it might actually be too dangerous, because what I really need to do was bring a slinky in, get two of you up. Well, if, if one of you pulls one end really hard, and the other one pulls the other end, then you'd stretch it out enough that maybe our helix might be sort of correct, because at the moment, these are far too tight. But there was a risk that everyone in the front row would sort of get whiplashed as somebody eventually let go or something. So, um, but yes, yeah, so, so you'll have to forgive me for talking about uh, uh, three-dimensional flow. But basically, that drives everything else. It ultimately drives your sedimentation and, uh, and the evolution of these channels. So I'm going to talk about, uh, obviously, there's a, a downstream component. But in particular, I'm going to talk about what we call the secondary flow or the helical flow, which is the kind of the cross-stream Ah, and I'm going to use my son by way of example. So uh, thank you, thank you for him uh, on uh, on this one. So um, uh, without boring you with the technical details of how we do things, um, we use acoustics uh, to measure our our velocities. And in fact, the the techniques are not dissimilar to the kinds of things we use to uh, image children uh, in the womb. Or in fact, these days you can use that kind of technology to measure flow in hearts and things, check whether the heart is okay in small babies and things. So anyway, it's the same type of technology. Um, so what I've done here is, is uh, we've taken data from, um, from a bend axis. So that's as said, the tight part of, of a bend. Um, and what we do in, in terms of rivers in, in here, then it shows exactly the kind of thing that, um, that it should do. Um, so if any of you ever took a course in, uh, in, in anything rivery, then, uh, then you'll know that uh, you, the secondary flow does this, and in fact, uh, the basal flows go towards the inner bank, and they actually form inner bank, inner bank of sediment accumulations. We call point bars and things uh, in here. But the surreal surprise was when we look at uh, density currents, um, the, the sort of direction of our slinky is the other way around, which actually, in some ways, is quite surprising given that for about 100 years of measuring bend flows in various things from tidal channels to rivers and so on, they've always gone the, uh, the way of rivers. So uh, so at least it shows that, uh, that you can get them going the other way. Now, you can do other experiments which show that sometimes they can be like, uh, be like rivers as well. But um, certainly a fair proportion of the time, they do exactly the opposite, which is very interesting in terms of the, in the sedimentation. However, the big problem with this kind of stuff is when you have something so radical, nobody will believe you. Uh, and this, I suppose, you can point at all the usual problems of labs. It's very small. And... Um, so what we've had to do is to uh, it's actually kind of find ourselves a real world channel where we could go and do this. Uh, and so in fact, in some ways, perhaps the best place on earth to go and study uh, gravity currents uh, on the sea floor is, uh, is off of the Strait of Bosphorus in the, uh, the Black Sea Shelf uh, in here. So for those of you um, who've been to Istanbul or would like to go, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's down here somewhere uh, on, the, on the Bosphorus Strait. Uh, and, uh, and the great thing is that the Mediterranean is, is hypersaline. So, so basically, it more, has more evaporation than it gets uh, freshwater input from rivers. Therefore, it actually has a higher salinity, higher density than, uh, than the main oceans. Uh, whilst in sharp contrast, the Black Sea gets far more river runoff than it does evaporation. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's far, far lower salinities. So what happens is that the, effectively the, the Mediterranean point is failing me, but uh, the, the Mediterranean uh, water comes in through the Strait of Bosphorus on the bottom as a dense layer, and when it hits the, uh, the Black Sea Shelf, it goes through this beautiful channel network, which we only knew of a few, a few years ago, 
Uh, and it gives us the other great thing about it is it runs pretty much all the time, which is ideal for experiments. Um, so uh, we've we've been out there. Uh, we took uh, so this is me on uh, on NERC's remote controlled autonomous underwater vehicle, otherwise known as a submarine. And uh, you'll see, pleasingly, it's it's yellow. So uh, <laughs> the, the Beatles had obviously done their their homework here. Apparently, all oceanographic submarines you can't buy a submarine. You can buy lots of these little things. They're all yellow. So anyway, I don't know why. But uh, so this is great. So you can uh, you can take this out in the boat, and uh, and you can drop this off, and it will literally fly around measuring your uh, your flow velocities on the sea floor. So it's a spectacularly nice piece of uh, piece of equipment. And uh, and when you do that, I've only given you one one line here, uh, but uh, you see exactly the same thing. So when you go to the bend apex uh, in here, you see the reds uh, at the bottom here are basically going uh, towards the outer bank. And the blues are coming back again, so we clearly could demonstrate that uh, that we do get reverse flows um, relative to uh, to rivers uh, in these systems. And in fact, we've been back; we've got loads more data, but I don't want to bore you with all the fluid dynamics. But we can look at various forces around the bend uh, now. So, um, which is actually the more we learn, the the more different they are. But still, I think there's only so much fluid dynamics you could live with. Um, uh, but we've also done the same sort of work in the uh, in the Yellow River. So where the Yellow River is full of sediment, uh, and when it hits one of these big reservoirs that the Chinese have built, then uh, it, uh, it it's denser and therefore it will go underneath. Now I have to say, it's one of the most um, amazing things I think I've ever seen. So you you uh, admittedly oh, we haven't got any health and safety people from the uh, good 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 because this was my boat, so <laughs> it it may not have passed uh, the uh, the faculty safety managers. Uh, anyway, this, this, is, uh, this is what we could do. Uh, but uh, basically, you, you then go, if you follow it down the Yellow River, you go through this big canyon. Uh, it's doing about one and a half, two meters per second. Uh, and, um, and then it's actually coming out here. So this sort of, this sort of a sort of a mucky color in here. So this is the river. But you can then sit out on the lake. This is us. And the astonishing thing is you can watch the entire flow of the Yellow River coming towards you, two meters per second. And then the entire lot slides underneath you. And you are just sitting above it. Uh, on, a, on an absolutely peaceful lake. So it's pretty amazing to watch the entire Yellow River vanish underneath you, and, uh, and it gives us a chance to look at it. And without going into too much detail, we've seen the same sort of thing uh, again. I suppose the only other thing I'll mention by way of passing is uh, this is Chairman Mao. It's obviously a controversial figure. I, I can uh, put my uh, political allegiances on the line by saying that uh, I took a distinct dislike to him, mainly because I made the major error of, uh, of leaning on, uh, on a brass statue in about 40 degrees centigrade, I can assure you, this is a very bad idea. You, you, you get burnt. So, uh, but anyway, uh, what I wanted to uh, to to uh, wrap up with is perhaps the most staggering of all the changes. So we've demonstrated that they look very different in terms of their behaviour and sort of geomorphology, uh, and they're undoubtedly very different a lot of the time in terms of their basic fluid dynamics, which, as I said, controls their sedimentation. But um, Perhaps they're really different because they, they actually change as a function of where you are on the Earth's surface. So a few years ago, I managed to get both children into this talk, which must be a record. So uh, this, is my, this is my oldest. And uh, a few years ago, I went to, uh, to Newfoundland in Canada on, uh, on a sort of a research uh, trip. And I spent, a, in, in between nipping out to look at the odd iceberg that was floating past, um, I, I spent an, even more time than normal looking and reading about submarine channels, which perhaps is not altogether healthy. But uh, uh, anyway, certainly one, one night, I woke up in the middle of the night with this brilliant idea. Um, now, this does happen occasionally. Uh, and, uh, and I just generally, I can't go back to sleep, so I just have to go downstairs, turn the, turn the computer on, uh, and type away. And I typed away for a couple of hours. Now, sadly, history rather suggests that uh, in the cold, hard light of day, when I wake up in the morning, most of the time, this is, in fact, nonsense. Uh, and, uh, and these aren't very good ideas at all. But, uh, but actually, this one, maybe there's something, maybe there is something in this. Uh, so I, I realized, very, it's a very obvious thing, but I realized that um, you only see images like this in, in all the papers. And I, I clearly, I'm guilty of exactly the same thing, because I've only shown you beautiful, sinuous channels. Um, but actually, I began to realize that maybe all of these are by the equator. So I've shown you things from Zaire and, and Amazon, uh, things and uh, the Indus and the Bengal and these these are all close to the equator, uh, but it's hard to find. So this is in fact this is the Amazon here. This is this is the Indus again. It's hard to find pictures of submarine channels at higher latitudes, um, mainly because they're straight. 
Uh, and even the ones you can show, so these are the Yongnack channels, these are in the Bering Sea. Um, even the examples, and then I've got ones, ones here from Greenland uh, in here, even here, um, geologists, despite being scientists, can actually be accused of, of showing too much interest in aesthetics and art, insofar as they only publish the most wiggly, the most unrepresentative examples they can find, because clearly nobody is interested in a very boring straight channel. They don't make for good copy. Um, so, uh, so yes, it's very hard to find these. Um, but I sort of knew that uh, this this uh, this must be wrong, insofar as uh, there's uh, a paper that has sort of stood the test of time for about 20 years uh, with this uh, with this paper in geology. And what they show here was um, with some very interesting features is that you could plot any one channel, um, and if you if you look at this, they do all have a clear pattern, whereby um, uh, at their higher reaches, the steeper slopes, then they're sort of low sinuosity, low wiggliness, then they they rise up to to meet some sort of uh, a sort of a peak in sinuosity around about the mid-fan, and then you drop off, eventually going back down to pretty much straight. Uh, and they use this thing called the, the peak sinuosity, um, and they basically uh, looked at this and, uh, and came up with this idea uh, over here in terms of the fan classification, that you could have two things. Either you ended up with uh, high sinuosity systems with low slopes, or low sinuosity, high slopes. And this has been the model for, uh, for as I said, the largest deposits on Earth, our submarine fans, for, uh, for about 20 years. Um, but of course, this was all diagrammatic, and it sort of works okay uh, on, on this basis. They certainly look as though sinuosity drops as you get towards steeper systems uh, in here. But what I did was, was actually just plot the data. I went, oh, hang on a second, let's just plot this. So if you take the peak sinuosities and the relevant slopes, what do you get? So I apologize for showing a graph, but uh, anyway, yeah, here's what you get. And if you've got a computer to plot something through it, then, uh, then you would generate this thing with an R squared of 0 0.12. What, what that means is that 12% of the variability is explained uh, by that variable, which is which is slope. You can get, you know, depending <laughs> which kind of wacky uh, line you put through it. If you use an exponential, you can get about 26% of the uh, uh, of the um, data is explained by that variation in slope. So, in, in actual fact, not very much. Um, clearly, 70 um, odd percent is explained by something else. And then all I did was. Uh, if you plot exactly the same data, so it's exactly the same examples, but you plot them by latitude, then you discover that about 74% of the variability is explained by changes in, in latitude. And whilst I'm not going to show you the plot, I did obviously check the obvious. Are slopes on the ocean floor changing with latitude? Uh, they don't. So it did seem a bit of a crazy idea, but uh, they don't change with, uh, with, uh, with latitude. So what is going on here then? It does seem as though there's a change. Uh, and more worryingly, I know that this is heresy because I did my PhD on rivers. So uh, this is nonsense, because rivers don't do this. It actually took me quite a long time to actually prove that rivers don't do this. It's actually quite a hard thing to do, but they don't. You get wiggly ones all over the world, and straight ones all over the world. Um, and so actually, you can use, you can generate a thing called the meandering ratio, which is a kind of a surrogate for sinuosity. So if, uh, if you're familiar with these sort of digital elevation models, you can get, sort of get large-scale coarse topographic maps of the whole globe. Um, you can actually measure the river systems on those, and if you compare the lengths of those to the kind of cartographic lengths where some cartographer has drawn every wiggle, uh, if you have those as a ratio, it basically gives you the sinuosity because the cool stuff misses all the small-scale wiggles, and the cartographer's got them all in. So this is basically sinuosity, and uh, oh, I don't you love computers? They will plot a line through anything. Uh, however, <laughs> what this R squared is saying is it's utterly meaningless. So, um, yes, yeah, so rivers simply don't show any latitudinal change whatsoever, but submarine channels do appear to. Um, so what on earth could be causing this? So we've got one of two choices. Either there's a change in sediment type and climate and potentially flow type. So certainly uh, a high latitudes. We, uh, we get lots of glacial action. We get lots of ground up rock dust. So lots of very fine grained particles, but ground up quartz is not sticky. Whilst um, if we went even further south off here, it, when we're in the tropics, lots of tropical weathering, lots of clay production, lots of sticky material, uh, and also perhaps changes in, in flows. So uh, down in the tropics, we get large river flows coming in, while perhaps at higher latitudes, we've got more in the way of glacial outburst floods, when you get these big sort of glacial ice dams lifting and, and, uh, and extreme conditions. So there are big differences. However, latitude's not always a good guide to climate. So here we are in, uh, in London. Uh, which is north of Calgary. Um, and uh, even allowing for this winter, uh, Calgary is a good deal colder. 
Um, so it very much, so Calgary is obviously mid-latitude. I couldn't, I couldn't manage to find a big city that's on the same latitude as London that's on a, on a sort of an ocean <laughs> margin. Um, but nevertheless, depending which side of the, of the ocean you're on, if we were on the, uh, uh, on the other side, we'd be sort of Labrador way, and it'd be exceptionally cold. So it makes a huge difference. So, so in some ways, latitude's a very poor guide. Uh, climate's a very poor guide to latitude. So the alternative is, and it's got something to do with spinning tops, or at least um, Coriolis Force. I'm trying to find an interesting way of the Coriolis Force. But the Coriolis Force is the... Uh, oh, I tell you what, I'll show that again, I think. Um, uh, the Coriolis Force is the spin of the Earth. And in fact, um, the Coriolis Force is very low at the equator, and it gets progressively larger as you go towards the poles. Uh, and so I wondered whether the Coriolis Force had something to do with this. Uh, and the interesting thing is if you plot Coriolis Force against, uh, against this plot, if you, uh, or at least the inverse of Coriolis Force uh, in here, then actually you get a really good fit. It's exactly the same sort of pattern, and it would not be affected by any of these differences in latitude that climate has. Um, so perhaps that is the way. I haven't got time, as it were, to show you some recent flume uh, data from uh, uh, Matthew Wells and Remo Kosu in, uh, from Toronto, but they use spinning tanks. If you're going to look at Coriolis in the lab, you need a spinning tank. Um, but they, they've got some mechanisms that do look as though this will work. So you can always ask me in the questions. Um, but the other interesting thing that I wanted to, uh, uh, to talk about by way of finishing is that uh, which I, if it's either Coriolis or it's to do with uh, changes in, in latitude and climate, then it suggests that not only is there a change in space over the current Earth, but also things would have changed over geological time. Because um, if, it's, if it's to do with climate, then it suggests that maybe the pattern we're looking at today is related to ice ages. We're coming out of an ice age. Uh, and that if we have, when we had periods of geological history when we didn't have uh, glacial cycles, then maybe we'd have had wiggly ones everywhere um, and straight ones everywhere. We wouldn't see this pattern. Um, or if it's to do with Coriolis, then uh, the Earth has been slowing down <laughs> over time. So the Earth spun very rapidly to begin with and it's been decreasing. So I'm showing you basically the last uh, billion years or so, and you can see it's got quite an appreciable drop. So if it's Coriolis, it suggests that back sort of 900 million years ago, like him, we certainly see deposits of that age, and when we look at the rocks, um, then they, they, the wiggliness would have been even closer, restricted even closer to the equator than it is now. So anyway, we don't know the answer yet. It's something, it's something very much to look at, but it suggests that they're really changing in both space and time. Ah, oh, it's locked up now. I might need the man to press this. It worked fine earlier. I fear they've heard the talk once then, and they've dropped on. <laughs> he needs to click on the uh, screen. I don't know why it does this. Hey, fantastic. So, um, a few years ago, I, uh, I, I made a prediction, uh, which is always dangerous. But uh, this is the most northerly submarine fan in, uh, in the world, the North Pole submarine fan. There's actually uh, very little data from it, despite the fact they managed to draw a red line through here, a, a red sort of channel network. There's actually sort of three data points across here, three sections. And what they can tell is the gradient is really low. So back in 2004, they predicted, using the sort of standard model, that uh, it would be exceptionally wiggly. So uh, I said a few years ago that I'd bet my house uh, on the fact that uh, that's not the case. And... Uh, Almost certainly, it, is, uh, uh, it will have virtually no sinuosity at all. It'll be almost straight. Uh, however, since then, I've been rather alarmed at the rate at which the Arctic ice is melting and somewhat fearful that I may, in fact, if I'm lucky, live long enough to, uh, to see whether this is true or not. Because once the ice melts, we'll be able to go and measure it very easily. So uh, anyway, let's, let's uh, conclude then. So uh, hopefully, uh, I can show you that submarine channels uh, I think, uh, it would be interesting to chat to a few of you afterwards, are uh, perhaps the least known large geomorphic feature on Earth. They're sort of largely hidden from you. I don't know why the media doesn't like them. They're not media friendly. Uh, they could be huge. So they're thousands of, of kilometers in length, and they're found both on ocean margins and increasingly we're, we're recognizing them uh, in, towards the center of oceans as well. Uh, they're fed by these really rather mysterious flows, which we know very little about, but uh, mixtures of, of particles and fluids. Um, I hope I've shown you that their channel evolution uh, and, and also the flow through these uh, are very dramatically different to, uh, to uh, their subaerial cousins. Um, and also that really surprisingly, they have a global variation in, uh, in channel sinuosity. About north or south of 50 degrees, they're straight. Uh, and also, this rather suggests that channels not only change in space, but in time, and they've changed over geological time. How they've changed, I don't know. 
But uh, hopefully we will discover that soon. Uh, by way of finishing, I apologize profusely for the fact that I have not uh, then made the link to some of this, uh, to sediments uh, and ultimately to rocks. But uh, I guess that's uh, an opportunity for another time. So anyway, thank you very much. That was terrific. Thank you, Jeff. I think you can be forgiven for not mentioning sediments with all the other things. A tour of the solar system was an excellent, excellent oh, way to begin. Now, Jeff you. tells me he's got very willing to take a few questions. Yes. So, microphones at the ready. Uh, they were wow, they're they, they, they were asleep. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you able to use the a hydrocarbon industry database on deep submarine fans, buried submarine fans in other words, which is very extensive across the world, to uh, reinforce your views or conversely. Uh, that's very well, that's excellent. Uh, if there's anyone here from the hydrocarbon industry, I would, I'd love to do this. Uh, this is, this is uh, very much what I'd like to do. Uh, as, uh, as you may know, getting uh, seismic out of companies is always very difficult, in the main part because it's generally owned by multiple companies. Um, it's, it's actually getting the, the man who owns 1% of it to sign. So uh, generally, if you're working with the lovely people like Shell, who sponsored this lecture, uh, then uh, they'd be happy to sign it off, but they've got to get all their partners. But actually, the other thing is that although it is extensive, um, there's obviously not that much in higher latitudes. So in particular, when it comes to submarine channels, very much West Africa, um, off of places like Trinidad, Gulf of Mexico, there's lots of data. This is actually, and they show huge amounts of wiggly channels. Um, but these are all close to the equator, uh, whilst actually there's very little data at higher latitudes that I've seen. Um, so whether this comes as, as, as people do more work in higher latitudes, uh, we'll see. But um, if anyone knows of, uh, of, of more data, I'd be very happy to look at it. But I think that's ultimately the way to test um, these, these ideas. Because the lovely thing about 3D seismic is you can tell what the sinuosity is, whilst when you look at the rock record, great for looking at the details of what your sediments look like but in fact you rarely know where you are on a bend very difficult to try and predict what kind of sinuosity channel you've got the nice thing about this would be that you could you can do this in in reverse that actually if you know first order that things are straighter then actually the sediments will then look different in these channels and you can make a first order prediction on the nature of your sediments based purely on the paleo latitude and that is something that is easily obtained from rocks we know where they were once upon a time. Well, let's go right to the back. Oh, here we are. Uh, the, the sediment that ends up in the fans, has that got any commercial value? Uh, the sediment itself, uh, I don't think so. Uh, it, uh, it's only got commercial uh, value in terms of the fact it's got holes in it. And holes are good for storing oil and gas and, um, and for then being able to get that oil and gas out of them. But uh, yeah, there's no, it's not like um, some of the work that's been done sort of close to mid-ocean ridges recently where people are talking about mining them for rare earths and things. No, I mean, it's, you only, by the time you've gone all the way to a submarine fan, you've got rid of a lot of the interesting minerals. You've got a lot of quartz, which is pretty abundant in the, grain, in the grand scheme of things. Is the relationship between, uh, is the relationship between the channel patterns and latitude seen in Mars and other celestial bodies that you started off your lecture with? Oh, that's, ah, that's a very good question. Um, to which I, I don't know the answer. Um, I've, I've not looked at that data. Um, I don't know whether, I, I presume actually there's complete enough data for much of, for much of this. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't honestly know. That's that going to be my emergency question. That would, <laughs> that would, these that would, are spinning, yes, aren't they? That would be very interesting indeed. Um, I mean, I, I suppose at a first order level, uh, in order for Coriolis to be important, if it's, if it's Coriolis, in order for it to be important, then you, you need relatively small density differences. So Coriolis is not very important, if at all, in river systems. Um, it only really becomes important when, you, um, when gravity becomes much less, because the gravity side of your sort of centrifugal force um, becomes much smaller, and therefore Coriolis can be bigger. Um, so many of those things, with if they were under small atmospheres, you, you wouldn't expect Coriolis to play a role. Um, I don't know too much about the climate of many of these things. Certainly places like Titan just seem cold, all, all, all round cold. But I know this would be fascinating. Yeah. 
And there was someone in the front. Ah, there we are. My question is quite similar. Uh, this uh, conclusion you've come to about the 50 degrees uh, separating straight and sinuous uh, channels, does that apply to Mars? Uh, again, I, I don't know. I literally have not looked at, at, uh, at planetary data. I, I must admit, I, I, um, uh, this would be an interesting thing to do. I've been guilty, I suppose, of, of, um, of being interested on, in Earth. Actually, I, I find it as a, as a, as a process sedimentologist, I mean, there's some beautiful work, and I know you've gone, the, the, the main man coming here, if you get a chance to get a ticket, John Kroxinger, um, to talk about the, the recent Martian work, but even, even for all the fancy instruments they've got, um, it's very hard to nail down processes on other planets. As you can see, actually, it's not so easy to do it here on Earth, but at least you can have a go. And so I guess in terms of my bent, I suppose, I really want to understand things and know the answers, and I kind of look at planetary geology, and much as I admire it, I think... It's almost impossible to get to some of these things on other planets, but certainly it would be interesting to look at the, at the basic morphological comparisons in terms of, of the sinuosity. It's dependent on the rotational velocity, presumably. It, it is, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, some of the other planets, I think like Venus, does Venus go around very rapidly, I think, does it? Yeah. So, yes, well, this would be and, very interesting. And tidal, yes. of course. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, in the front here. Oh, thanks, Jeremy. Thank you very much for that updating of me. I began my life with uh, stories not of breaks on uh, uh, the internet, but of course cutting Europe off from America on the telephone system when uh, Grand Banks, uh, oh yes. uh, which obviously was, as uh, shown later in the 50s when I was doing my research, almost certainly was a turbidity current, mm -hmm. and you've got a very nice channel there that you showed running exactly where the break in the submarine cable took place. So thank you for that. It. Yes, yes, yes. Um, that's a sort of a much bigger example of, of what I showed from, from Nice. Quite. Uh, picking up on the uh, comment about sediment, let me take you back to some sediment, 400 million year old sediment, on which I worked for, for three years. And, and the study of those uh, uh, beds, in this case in the south of Scotland, um, you were able at least to make fairly good interpretations, at least I believe they were good, they held for many years, uh, in terms of what the turbidity current must have been like by virtue of what you were looking at on the bottom of the beds in which were finally deposited. What your talk has called into question a bit, I think, with me is whether terms like proximal and distal still have the same kind of meaning in terms of turbidites from, from, the, from the channels you've been describing. Whether after all I might have been right in believing that it was a facies change in the south of Scotland, not yet another gigantic fault in the tectonic plate that suddenly produced uh, northward uh, younging rocks against another set of northward younging rocks without any apparent break in them. Um, but uh, I think the question really is, have you begun to get some ideas on turbidity currents which would call into question some of the, uh, the conclusions that we were reaching from fossil turbidites as opposed to oh, your uh, present day uh, ones. Uh, well, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm not the leading exponent in this field, but uh, I think our broad ideas on what's proximal and what's distal, so near and far, uh, have remained much the same. But our interpretation of the types of flows uh, that might have formed them have certainly changed. And, and I certainly have a major problem that I lack faith. I, I, I increasingly, although I do do some uh, some uh, uh, some rocks, of course, and look out and look at rocks. I honestly think I lack the faith, sufficient faith to do deep marine rocks, because because anyone who works on turbidites uh, in the field is able to talk about low density turbidites, high density turbidites. Uh, given that no one has ever seen any of these, uh, and uh, would have not the slightest idea, as a man who works on the sort of fluid dynamics in the lab of things, not the slightest idea. I mean, poor, poor old field geologists can't do anything else. I mean, they, they are forced to interpret what they have. But it's very much what drives me when I go and look at those rocks. It very much drives me back to these other sort of techniques because I, I simply find it difficult to stand there and go, oh, yes, look, that's a high-density turbidite versus a low-density turbidity current or whatever. I, I just, uh, there's just not enough information there for me to be able to make that call. So, so there's a huge, I mean, it's a fascinating um, topic. Um, there's a huge amount of breakthroughs here. I mean, we're certainly beginning to see flows transforming um, the other way. So things like the Nice slide would have started off as really quite um, concentrated material, uh, and it would have diluted to become 
um, something uh, that looks more like a turbidity current. But in actual fact, there's plenty of evidence now that sometimes uh, in the deep sea, that actually things start eroding more mud and they begin to reconcentrate. And actually, when they're deposited, they're probably very high concentration. But again, putting some numbers on that is hard. Last one. Um, hi, I'm quite interested in um, what kind of shape of channel you would think would pose more of a um, problem in a sort of risk context, for example, tsunamis, whether it would be um, sinuous or straight. Because I know that from where, where I've been looking at, say, volcanic slope failure, a lot of the, the slope failures tend to have extended onto a kind of more straight current. And I'm just wondering what you think would be more important. Yeah, I would say it makes very little difference. Uh, insofar as it, it's all happening right at the top of your system, it's very much the shape uh, of your failure. So, um, I mean, it's one of the great unknowns, particularly for us, uh, of, of slope failure off of, off of Norway. Uh, it's probably the thing that poses the main danger to us. I mean, there were huge tsunami in the past, which went straight over the top of Shetland. Apologize. Apologies if you come from Shetland. Um, but uh, but uh, yes, yeah, it's a real problem to us. And certainly we've seen some spectacular examples, not always linked to channels, but certainly in 1992 in Papua New Guinea, there was a big tsunami that was caused by uh, one of these relatively small slope failures, but it drove a really um, tightly concentrated sort of 15 meter high wave on shore um, and killed several thousand people. So, But I, I suspect the channel itself, by the time you get sufficient, because they start off straight uh, on steep slopes, by the time you get sufficient um, sinuosity, uh, you're at great depth, and therefore it probably makes makes very little difference. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, just before we thank you properly, I think it, we ought to be remembering that we can go outside to the lower library to practice some fluid dynamics of the, <laughs> of the red and white variety. So, Jeff, thank you very much for a riveting lecture. Thank you.